Um, and so in these sort of vague projections and estimates, um, there was an estimate that if marijuana were federally legal, uh, that it would be the largest cash crop in the United States. There's a 2006 study done by John Getman, and you know, his figures aren't perfect, and like I said before, a lot of people, you know, to an extent there's, there's a bit of wishful thinking. I think on some folks' part, and Gil Getman may be guilty of that too, but I think his main point stands that it is, relative to other crops that we grow, an extremely valuable one. In his uh, 2006 study, Getman estimated that marijuana would be the largest cash crop in the U.S., surpassing corn, or soybeans, or peanuts, or cotton, or hay, or grain, or any other, th any other thing we grow and would even be the largest cash crop in a number of states. And I think, I think it would amount to over a billion dollars in sort of like raw revenue. States like California, Kentucky, and Tennessee would see where they grow it. And that includes, you know, marijuana grown for recreational and medicinal purposes, but also hemp, both industrial hemp and all the derivatives, hemp seeds, hemp seed oil, and everything else you can get from it. So in all of these projections also, this is just the actual crop of marijuana. Has there been any, I guess, estimates or studies about sort of derivative economies like accessories that would be used for marijuana or other products that could be uh, sort of used in conjunction with this crop? Yeah, you know, there's sort of the, there's the obvious market, you know, for uh, cannabis culture products, I guess you could call them, you know, pipes, glass pipes, ceramic pipes, wood pipes, filters, blunt wraps, rolling papers, t-shirts, uh, grinders, you know, everything, you know, here, there, and in between. And there's also sort of a, a less a less understood market for these products that people understand to an extent, but it's really just coming up. Hydroponic growing systems, um, more advanced irrigation technology, testing technology, a rise of maybe a, you know, there, there are certain educational programs that have come up too. I know there's, um, there's the school out in California that was shut down that will probably see another forum come around in the near future. And even more so, like I was saying before, the real, the real area that has yet to materialize, that will hell have to at some point, if it's going to become a, you know, a so-called like white market economy, is compliance. You know, obviously in any gold rush, the lawyers are going to have to make some money and dealing with those agencies, the EPA, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and probably most importantly, the Food and Drug Administration will require a lot of compliance work for these new companies that are coming up with, you know, dozens or so popping up every single day. Um, that is, that, that's just, I really, just a slice of that sort of secondary market that's developed around, you know, the main product, you know, marijuana. Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking about all of this regulation and red tape and bureaucracy that uh, people are going to have to go through, does that sort of affect who is going to be able to access those licensing and uh, those like distribution techniques? So would it be harder, for example, for like a smaller operation to get through all of that bureaucracy and sort of how would that look in terms of like a corporate marijuana landscape? Oh, sure. I, I know in Massachusetts, which just um, in 2000 in 2012 legalized medical marijuana it was said that even to apply uh, would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars just to even put in the application. You know, compliance is expensive. Compliance is expensive and even trying to become established in any of these industries and meet the high regulatory standards that we are going to set is going to be tough. It's a trade-off, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate to an extent because it may very well be the thing that stops the rise of sort of mom and pop mom and pop brands mom and pop companies you still have your corner stores you still have people who can sell marijuana probably pretty easily but to actually you know grow and market the product these kind of expenses definitely put the market at risk for once again being taken over by you know large monopolizing corporations Mm -hmm. And has there been, uh, I guess, any discussion of how that would also look politically in terms of like the tobacco lobby is well known for 
political influence and for sort of dealings in Washington, would that be maybe paralleled in a similar marijuana economy if it was taken over by sort of a corporate landscape here? Yeah, probably. It's a lobby for everything, isn't there? Right now, there is there is already a marijuana lobby of groups, um, the National Organization to Reform Marijuana Laws, and there are other groups, but Normal has really been spearheading the effort to their credit for a long time. But they are a very, you know, they are a very, I guess what they would call business-friendly organization, and I wouldn't be surprised to see a group like that either, you know, fade away and be replaced by a, maybe an actual business group, or really it, for it to just you know, become the sort of business lobbying arm of the of a big marijuana or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm.